Washington, D.C., this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Hannah Zuberi. First, the headlines. Biden says he will designate Qatar as a major non-NATO U.S. ally. Pneumonia cases soaring, killing children in Afghanistan. Hindutva extremists celebrate murder of Gandhi on January the 30th. Rohingya say coup in Myanmar, obstacle to repatriation. Modern day slavery condemned by church in Tanzania. Saudi Islamic minister appoints first woman undersecretary. And our top story tonight, U.S. President Joe Biden on Monday designated Qatar as a major non-NATO ally. Biden spoke alongside Qatari Emir Sheikh Tamim Bil Hamad Afani at the White House. He said Doha has been critical to vital American interests, including aiding the U.S. mission in Afghanistan and providing assistance to the besieged Gaza Strip. The partnership has also kept pressure on ISIS militants in the region, he said. Afani said he would address the equal rights of the Palestinian people during his meeting with Biden, as well as other regional issues. The U.S. and Qatar are marking the 50th anniversary of their bilateral relationship. Six historically black colleges and universities have received bomb threats for the second time in January. Howard, Bowie State, Bethune, Cookman, Southern, Delaware State, and Albany State Universities reported potential threats Monday. The FBI is investigating the bomb threats with local law enforcement. Members of the public are urged to report anything suspicious to law enforcement immediately, the FBI told ABC News. Agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms are also responding to the reports. A U.S. District Court judge Monday rejected a plea deal allowing a white man convicted of murdering Ahmad Arbery to serve a large part of his sentence in federal prison. Judge Lisa Godby Woods decision rejecting Travis McMichael's plea agreement with federal prosecutors came after emotional statements by Arbery's parents and two aunts. They asked the judge to reject the deal and proceed with the federal trial next week. A second hearing on a plea deal the government's attorneys negotiated with McMichael's 66-year-old father was also scheduled on Monday. Wood said her decision would be the same in the case of the father, Gregory McMichael. The McMichaels were convicted on state charges in the February 23, 2020 murder of 25-year-old Arbery, who was jogging in Glynn County, Georgia, when the McMichaels killed him. Fulton County, Georgia's District Attorney Fannie Willis asked the FBI Sunday to assess security at her courthouse. The request came in response to comments by the former President Donald Trump against prosecutors investigating his business dealings and conduct after the 2020 election. Trump is at the center of at least two criminal investigations. He told a rally of thousands of supporters Saturday in Conroe, Texas. He hoped to see the largest protest to date if prosecutors do anything wrong or illegal. Willis wrote that a grand jury will convene on May 2nd, adding that her office will not be influenced or intimidated by anyone as this investigation moves forward. Cases of pneumonia are soaring in Afghanistan, killing children who are unable to access healthcare facilities. The humanitarian group Save the Children said on Monday. The surge is happening amidst a hunger crisis, the group said in a statement. A hospital doctor told the nonprofit 135 children have died in or on their way to the hospital last December due to pneumonia and severe malnutrition. The collapse of Afghanistan's healthcare system is driven largely by frozen financial assets and withdrawn aid coming to a deadly cost to children. The U.S. alone has frozen nearly $9.5 billion in assets belonging to the Afghan Central Bank and stopped shipments of cash to the country. Afghanistan's economic freefall is threatening to leave more than 95% of the population in poverty, the group's statement said. A new book about Mahatma Gandhi's killer titled Gandhi's Assassin reveals that Ramachandra Vinayak Godse was a member of the RSS Hindu nationalist group. 
Gandhi, who led a non-violent movement for India's independence and advocated for Hindu-Muslim unity, was assassinated on January the 30th, 1948, by Godse. Godse was a member of the Rashtriya Swaya Sevak Sangh, RSS, all along. The book dispels the myth that Godse had left the group that aims for India to be a Hindu nation. The RSS is the ideological arm of India's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party. Many government ministers, including Prime Minister Narendra Modi, are former RSS members. On Mahatma Gandhi's death anniversary on Sunday, the Hindu Mahasabha paid tribute to his assassin Naturam Godse and co-accused Narayan Apte. The right-wing group observed Godse Apte Smriti Diwas in Madhya Pradesh's city of Gwalior. Leaders sought to express anger over the duo's arrest on January 13, 1948. The group also bestowed the Godse Apta Bharat Ratna Award on jailed religious leader Kali Charan Maharaj and four leaders of the Mahasabha. Maharaj was arrested last December for allegedly making derogatory remarks against Gandhi during a Dharma Sansad in Chhattisgarh's capital, Raipur. Bringing more international news stories after the break. Stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes Walk a mile in my shoes Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse Walk a mile in my shoes Friends, our world is pulling together like never before. We're making huge sacrifices to keep one another safe. Scientists are working non-stop to develop COVID-19 vaccines and treatments. A vaccine will get our economies moving. It will tell our loved ones we're safe again. But we have challenges we must address. Right now, huge pharmaceutical companies are keeping the vaccine research a secret. They're deciding how many vaccines get made, how much to charge for them, and who gets vaccinated. This will no doubt leave billions of people behind. Pharma companies are putting profit, not people, first. Yet, billions of dollars of taxpayers' money is funding their work. We cannot let the CEOs of a handful of pharmaceutical companies decide our future. We need a vaccine that everyone can have free of charge, no matter where you live or whether you're rich or you're poor. We need companies to share all their research so we can make enough safe vaccines for everyone. We need a vaccine owned by all of us. To end this COVID-19 pandemic, we need to pull together once more. Israel forced two Palestinian families in occupied East Jerusalem to demolish their own homes on Monday. The Sukirat family said on Israeli court issued a final decision Sunday ordering their homes to be razed. To avoid the cost of the demolition, homeowners and brothers Mahmoud and Daoud Sukirat and their families began clearing out their homes in Jabal al muqabbar Israel often uses the lack of construction permits as a pretext to demolish Palestinian homes, especially in the Area C of occupied West Bank. The 1995 Oslo Accords divided the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, into three portions, Area A, B, and C. 
Area C is under Israel's administrative and security control until a final status agreement is reached with the Palestinians. Mali on Monday gave the French ambassador 72 hours to leave the West African country after hostile remarks by French authorities about its transitional government. Joel Meyer, the French ambassador to Bamako, was summoned by Mali's Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. Meyer was notified of the decision urging him to leave the territory within 72 hours, according to a government statement read out by state television. Malian authorities decided to expel Meyer after what they call hostile and outrageous comments by French officials against them. At a press briefing Thursday, French Foreign Minister jean Li Diarien castigated the Malian junta, describing it as illegitimate. Vogue France has been criticized after publishing a social media post many users branded as offensive to Muslim women. It shared a photo of an, on Instagram on Friday of an actress and model, Julia Fox, wearing a piece of fabric wrapped around her head with the caption, yes to the headscarf. Since then, the caption has been edited to remove the line. The photo was posted as part of a montage featuring Fox and her boyfriend, rapper Kanye West, at Haute Couture Fashion Week in Paris. French Moroccan model and activist Hanan Hashmi told CNN that the hijab has been reduced to simply an accessory. Meanwhile, the hijab is seen by the French ministers as the uniform of terrorists, she said. Rohingya Muslims living in refugee settlements in Bangladesh say that the February 1st, 2021 military coup in Burma is a barrier to sustainable repatriation. Burma's democratically elected leader Aung San Suu Kyi was ousted and jailed in the coup along with many of her party's leaders. A refugee Mayu Khan said escalating tensions have made repatriation of Rohingya almost impossible. More than 750,000 Rohingya Muslims fled the brutal military crackdown in Burma's Rakhine state on August 25, 2017, according to Amnesty International. The number of refugees housed in squalid makeshift tents in Bangladesh's south district of Cox's Bazar has surged to more than 1.2 million. Anglican clergymen in Tanzania's Indian Ocean Zanzibar archipelago have condemned the slave trade as the worst crime ever committed by humans against other humans. The Christchurch Anglican Cathedral, perched at the heart of Stonetown, is a symbol of remembrance to the men, women, and children sold into slavery. The massive cathedral, built on the former slave market, also serves as a reminder of the Anglican Church's role in the abolishment of East African slave trade. The Reverend Charles Malaliva of the Zanzibar Diocese said that although the slave trade left an indelible stain on the history of Zanzibar, it is a stark reminder to reject modern-day slavery. Saudi Islamic Minister Sheikh Abdul Latif al-Sheikh on Sunday appointed Layla bin Hamad al-Qasim as the Undersecretary for Planning and Digital Transformation. Al-Qasim is the first female undersecretary in the Ministry of Islamic Affairs, Dawa, and Guidance. Al-Al-Sheikh entrusted Al-Qasim with the governance of his office as part of the developing administrating administrative work of the ministry, improving services and promoting transparency. Al-Qasim's latest appointment is part of the minister's efforts to promote the role of women in leadership positions within the ministry and its agencies. It also reflects Al Al Sheikh's belief in the importance of Saudi women in developing and achieving the government's goals. Coming up next after the break is our in depth analysis segment, so stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. over my 
my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. you now and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome back. Today is the first anniversary of the 2021 military coup in Burma. To discuss this, we have with us Adam Carroll, who is the team lead for the Burma Task Force at the human rights organization, Justice for All, and he also leads their UN programs. Welcome, Adam. Thank you, Sister Hannah. Nice to be here. So um, let's talk about this past year. You've been following this coup very carefully over the past year. You've been very involved with the work on the Rohingya genocide for many, many years. Can you uh, share with us any decisive moments or flashback or flash points that have stood out in the past year? Well, you know, it's been a very rough year for the people of Burma. Um, I have to say, though, that they've shown amazing commitment to resisting the uh, military takeover of their government. Um, they're so determined and they're sacrificing so much. Um, you know, after the coup began, there was a wave of arrests, uh, several thousand uh, torture, uh, killing in the jails. Uh, some were released and then arrested again. Uh, many of the journalists had to flee. Uh, the um, national, uh, the NLD party that Aung San Suu Kyi led uh, after her arrest. Um, many of the other leaders had to flee or were arrested. But instead of that uh, ending the struggle, it really gave the people uh, a motivation to make the struggle their own. Instead of these elites who had run both political parties and not really worked well with the ethnic parties. Instead, we saw a new rising leadership linked both to the NLD party, but also to the ethnic groups. Uh, and there was a recognition that Rohingya need to be included as well. That's still a work in progress, but the National uh, Unity Government, which is the, the group of um, sort of government in exile, which is an alternative to the military junta, they have said that they accept the international criminal court processes and that they should be the ones rec uh, uh, who represent Burma, both at the UN and at the courts. Whether that will happen, we don't know. But at the UN so far, they are still in the seat of the government, um, and they are trying to keep uh, uh, included. We haven't gotten formal recognition from the U.S. government, for example, but we can say that our senior State Department people meet with the national unity government people. They're on the right track there. But if I was going to say other things about the last year, I would add that there have been various really brutal bombing campaigns, um, hundreds, I of thousands, I think about 700,000 now have been um, displaced over the last year. Um, and this is not even counting the earlier displacement of the Rohingya during their genocide, their ongoing genocide. So uh, the country is not only displaced, but um, medical personnel have been targeted, schools have been targeted, a lot of students 
are no longer in class. Um, there have been um, disruptions in the food supply, in electricity. And uh, when we call for boycotts or sanctions, we know that the Burmese people want that too, even though it will add another layer of suffering uh, because they are boycotting their own military. Uh, they are making sacrifices already. Um, we could say other flashpoints have been recently uh, the ASEAN uh, nations uh, who were kind of given the responsibility by a number of, of countries, including our own, to lead the international response. They took a, a rather weak peacemaking response, but even that, their five-point plan, it, the Burmese military generals failed to comply at all and just played games. And uh, that did result in the Burmese generals being disinvited from various official meetings with ASEAN. Whether that is the plan going forward, we don't know because the Cambodia is now uh, heading ASEAN for this calendar year, and they seem to be taking a somewhat different approach. Uh, they're more cozy with the military generals, but there's pushback from uh, Singapore, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, and other countries who belong to ASEAN. Um, we see that the oil companies also recently uh, Total and Chevron announced that they are withdrawing completely from Burma, uh, which is big because they've been paying millions of dollars to the generals. And yet many of the Japanese and other Asian um, oil and gas companies have not followed that yet. Uh, we need sanctions. Uh, we need a lot more um, uh, serious sanctions before uh, the generals feel the pressure. Uh, and finally, above all, it's very important to stop selling arms to the Burmese military. So recently, Burma Task Force released a statement on the anniversary of the coup. What is the Burma Task Force doing? Yes. Uh, well, for the anniversary, we have released a statement uh, calling for an end of arms sales by China, Russia, and India, um, and um, pointing out our solidarity with the people of Burma. Um, we also signed on to a joint letter of 233 Burmese and other international groups um, calling on uh, President Biden uh, to take a stronger response against the Burmese junta. Um, we've continued to press the uh, US Congress to pass the Burma Act. Unfortunately, the Republican leadership in the Senate um, has blocked the uh, movement of this legislation. Um, I have to admit that um, uh, Speaker uh, Mitch McConnell issued a very good statement today for the anniversary, even embracing the national unity government that I was just uh, speaking about. Uh, I, but on the same time, they are blocking this legislation. They are blocking actual action. So we want to see more than words. We want to see more action. Um, this is a difficult situation because um, we, we don't know how many months or years this struggle will have to continue to restore democracy or to restore human rights and the human rights of the Rohingya. So this is not something that can be fixed uh, overnight. Um, the uh, uh, representatives in Congress, Representative Chabot and Eshu, have uh, introduced a resolution today uh, to condemn the, the Burmese military for the coup. Uh, also, um, the, uh, there's going to be a briefing next week on the 17th in the Asia Subcommittee uh, of the um, House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, they've sent letters and uh, people are writing letters and talking, but we need to see more action. How has the media been covering the anniversary of the Burmese military coup? You know, listening to the BBC this morning, BBC World, uh, they went in quite a bit of depth, uh, focusing on the struggle of the people 
it was effective in humanizing all those Burmese who have now had to leave their homes and gone into the jungles and learn how to fight. Um, they interviewed one millennial or no, sorry, gener Generation Z guy who said, I'm used to waking up in the morning and immediately looking at my phone, but I can't do that in the jungle. We have no phones. Uh, and they are learning uh, to to shoot guns. And, uh, you know, the Burmese military has such advanced weaponry. China has recently even sent uh, sold them a submarine. You know, why do they possibly need a submarine? And so they are, in some respects, very uh, much stronger, but the people are much more determined. And asymmetrical warfare is the thing. You can call it terrorism. You can call it freedom fighting. Uh, there should be rules around it, but people are determined and they're going to do what they have to. Um, but unfortunately, uh, other countries have not been sending them supplies, as we see just recently with Ukraine getting supplies in their struggle. So it's very unfortunate, but diplomacy does not seem to be working. Um, and uh, while we support diplomacy, um, we understand why people feel that they must take up arms. Uh, the uh, What I have noticed in the media reports is they kind of avoid the arms deals. They don't go into that as they should. And they also um, don't necessarily um, talk much about the national unity government, that these people, these PDFs, which are uh, people's defense forces, that they actually are coordinated, that this is not just um, people uncoordinated taking action, but there's a plan. So I think it's important to recognize that the, the, there's a, a real potential for unity. Uh, working towards unity means also um, creating a federation where all the ethnic groups are respected, it means changing the constitution because the 2008 constitution was written by the military and it's part of the problem. It's an underlying uh, deep part of the problem, uh, which ensures the military is, is mixed up in everything. Um, so this is really a big problem and a big challenge. Um, and if you, you, U.S. and the international community really put their minds to it and do more, you know, we see so many frustrating situations at the United Nations as far as action being blocked. We see the, the UK not doing nearly enough to push against, uh, we know, the, uh, you know, they, they are pushing against China and Russia, and those countries may veto any action in the Security Council, but the UK is not even trying to do that. So uh, we've got to keep pushing. And uh, yeah, we, we may be you know, have many anniversaries to come. I really hope not, uh, because we won't see Rohingya repatriated any time while the military is still in power, and we won't see others uh, back in school or, you know, having a, a decent future if the military is still in power. Truly a worrisome situation. Thank you so much for being here with us, uh, Adam Carroll from Burma Task Force. Thank you, Sister Hannah. Nice to be with you. Thank you so much. That's all from our Washington studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can find previous episodes and more on our YouTube or Facebook. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.